Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think we can get started. We have our full panel here. Thank you uh, for coming to this session. I see a lot of you um, were in our morning session that touched on um, urban violence, in particular focusing on Latin America. So I think this will be an interesting um, follow-up to some of those issues, but also um, a broader look at um, conflict in the region. Um, my name is Katie Prudhomme. I'm the Latin American Caribbean team lead for OTI. And I'm very pleased to introduce our three panelists, um, all of whom have um, studied, analyzed, written on, and developed programming around a lot of conflict issues in Latin America. Beth Hogan, Stephen Dudley, and Doug Farah. And their full bios are in the uh, documentation that you have. Um, but I'll just say a few words um, about each one. Um, Stephen, Dud Stephen Dudley is co-director of Insight Crime, which is a joint initiative of AU and the foundation Insight Crime in Medellin, Colombia, which monitors, analyzes, and investigates organized crime in the Americas. Um, Mr. Dudley is a longtime reporter, investigator, and consultant who studied trends and tendencies of organized crime. Uh, he's also a book on, author of a book on Colombia's civil war. Um, we're very lucky to have two journalists in the room today. Um, Doug Farah is president of IBI Consultants and a senior fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center. He's a national security consultant and analyst. Um, prior uh, to this role, he worked for the Consortium for Study of Intelligence, studying armed groups and intelligence reform. He was also uh, the Bureau, West Africa Bureau Chief for the Washington Post um, from 2000 to 2004. Um, Beth Hogan uh, is currently um, uh, acting administrator for uh, USAID's Latin America and Caribbean Bureau, and uh, her responsibilities include oversight of USAID's programs, policies, planning, and personnel through th throughout the region. Um, prior to assuming this role as senior DEA for Latin America, um, Beth served as the director of the Haiti Task Team at USAID. Um, She's a member of the Senior Foreign Service with 30 years of development experience um, throughout not only Latin America, but also Africa and Asia. So I'm um, very pleased to have these three speakers with us today. The, the, whole, the uh, name of this panel, Future of Conflict in Latin America, I think poses some really interesting questions about how the region has evolved um, in the last 20 years and how it will evolve in the future. Um, a lot of observers uh, could could look at the framing of this panel and sort of question why the word conflict was used. It's um, uh, easy to look at Latin America right now and see a region in which peace and prosperity um, are really two of the dominant trends. There's been a decrease in bilateral conflict. There's been economic growth throughout the region. There has been um, increased regional integration. There have been improved socioeconomic indicators. But I think a lot of other analysts just look at the question and say, conflict has morphed. What we're seeing now um, is no less uh, relevant than it was in the past. We're simply looking at different types of conflict. And we need to have a different lens and different programming tools to address those conflicts. We, um, for example, we look right now at the situation in Colombia. And if the government and the FARC is able to sign an agreement uh, and peace accords are ratified in Colombia, we would see the end to one of the hemispheres, or actually the hemisphere's longest running conflict between a state and a non-state actor. Um, that m may not spell the end of conflict in Colombia. In fact, I think the prediction is we'd see a lot more um, lateral conflict. Um, on the other hand, it would spell the end to one of the predominant modalities of conflict over the years between a state actor and a non-state actor with a political agenda. Uh, so that's something I think that is um, critical interest to, to policymakers in the US and, and certainly in Colombia itself. One of, the other, um, one of the other battlefields of the past has been the ideological divide in Latin America. Um, your left and your right wing um, uh, schools of thought. Um, that's, that's certainly def it's defined politics um, for the last uh, few decades. Um, and that battle right now, I think, is largely being fought um, in the form of different alliances. Um, it's turned into an economic um, 
it turned into a question of an economic and political definition rather than a battlefield um, in any other way. And so that's one area in which we are seeing um, how competition has superseded conflict. And I think one of the areas that our panelists will speak to the most um, is that of the increasing um, influence that transnational criminal organizations and um, other criminal organizations, national ones, um, are influencing the countries in which they operate, primarily in the Northern Triangle. And uh, this summer, um, we all saw the we all saw the effects of rising crime and insecurity in Latin America, and what those how those um, trends are impacting uh, our borders and the influence that events in Latin America continue to have on the U.S. Um, so this is, a, this is a critical area for us to be focused on, I think, when we're looking at conflict and something that our panelists will speak to, both in terms of whether we understand the situation adequately, um, are we watching the right things, do we understand the nuances, do we understand how the problem is evolving, and do we have the right tools? Do we have the programming responses that are adequate and appropriate for this problem set? And we spoke to that a little bit this morning in our panel on urban violence, and I hope we can get uh, further into that today. So with that, I'd just um, like Stephen to uh, ask Stephen if he can kick off his presentation. Thanks. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation, opportunity to uh, just, uh, I guess, put out uh, a few thoughts here um, with regards to the topic at hand. Topic at hand, obviously, a uh, very difficult one, predicting the future. Um, I, I'm going to tell you right now that uh, I'm going to have a very hard time doing that and um, mostly not going to try to predict the future. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is lay out sort of three things that I think um, are steady uh, when we look at the dynamics of organized crime. Um, I'm going to speak mostly about uh, the, maybe more from sort of a upper echelon or society building perspective uh, with regards to organized crime and leave my colleague Doug to talk more about um, things such as, uh, you know, street gangs and uh, relationship with transnational criminal organizations and those sorts of things. So hopefully that will be a decent balance. Um, there, there are three basic points. Uh, that I want to relate to you before we open everything up uh, to talk about them. Um, the first, um, and again, I think that this is this is important to consider um, when when we look towards the future. Is is if we need to think about the past. Um, and the first is that in in all instances that that we've seen that we study, what what we see is um, that crime starts where a reliable guarantor, not necessarily the state but a reliable guarantor of interactions between citizens stops. So that is where we see space for criminal actions. Um, obviously, I'm relying a lot on people such as Diego Gambetta and others who talk about this idea of you know, a, a guarantor in economic transactions, uh, a guarantor, somebody who protects um, physical space, um, someone who can who can settle um, disputes between neighbors, um, those sorts of things. Um, but, but most of all, sort of the regulators of that space, the regulators of that territory. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to do with a state actor, although it can be a state actor that, that is playing that role. Um, we, we see criminal organizations arise in these territories. They're some con, uh, you know, sometimes referred to as you know, uh, unoccupied territories or stateless territories or that sort of thing. But we also see them in, in other respects as well, where you don't have a sort of reliable rule system, a reliable accountability system. And, and we see state actors also filling these gaps. Um, in, some of, in some of our studies, what we've seen is a, what, what we're calling a sort of bureaucratic elite um, that will emerge within uh, state entities. Uh, mostly having to do with um, military or police functions, and they also too have, are they're very susceptible to entering into this territory, becoming the only reliable guarantor into these spaces, 
and, and then becoming criminal actors themselves. Uh, very often what we see, in fact, if you look at most uh, major areas where there is criminal activity in Latin America in particular, you will find policemen. You will find ex-policemen. You will find current policemen. There's a reason for this. This is because there is, their territory is where crime thrives. That's the first point. The second point I want to make is that crime certainly plays a role can play a role in, in distorting things such as um, economic interactions. Um, you know, we're tracking a case now in, in El Salvador that has to do with the, with the bean market, the flour market, and ways in which a criminal actor can even distort those markets and those economies. Um, but I think the other thing we need to keep in mind is that, that crime over the years in our history has played a role in the formation of the state as well. Um, I'm thinking about pirates, thinking about marauders. I'm thinking about characters that have been, you know, portrayed in, in a very nice light. Um, thinking about uh, our own American heroes, John Hancock, who moved molasses uh, for the illegal rum trade, you know, second signatory of the Declaration of Independence. These guys are part and parcel of the formation of a nation state those nascent nation states that relied on paramilitary forces, that relied on the economic activity of these particular actors that were maybe not necessarily deemed illegal at the time. Um, this, is the, this is what we're seeing, I think, in many respects in the region and what we will continue to see in the region. You see this, this, this confluence of various types of actors um, acting in concert sometimes. And these are the power structures that are emerging in places like Guatemala, in places like Honduras. They're a mixture of actors. Some of them are criminal, or we would call criminal in nature. Some of them are politicians. Some of them are traditional or non-traditional or emerging elites. Um, but they're all occupying similar spaces. And, and they're all playing for <laughs> Right now, they're playing for a winner-take-all sort of game. And, and I feel like at times we lose sight of this. And, 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 and the reason we say that it's kind of a winner-take-all sort of game is because the way in which the, these criminal actors can very quickly integrate themselves into these, into these spaces, into these social, political, and economic spaces, we think that's because the people within those spaces think of this as a zero-sum game. They think of this as a winner-take-all. So they say to themselves, the only way I can move my economic project forward, my political project forward, is if I align myself with criminal interests. The third point I want to make, and, and this is also in, in the hopes that we can, we can push the debate forward, at least internally. I'm not sure if you'll ever be able to talk about this in a public voice in any of your meetings at OTI or anywhere else, is that I think we need to stop using these terms good guys and bad guys. I'm going to borrow from Von de Feldbad Brown, who talks about good criminals, the search for good criminals. Because in the formation of these, of what we're seeing now, the formation of these nation states, you have to find, you have to weed out the good criminals. Not everybody is going to be clean, but you need to find those people and you need to work with those people. You need to engender those people. They're not gonna be completely squeaky clean in part because of the environment in which they operate, but they are the ones who in the end, and if we look again at our own history, we will see the lesson being told. They are the ones in the end who can help to foment a functional state. And that's really what we're after. We're after the sort of creation of some sort of state that is much more inclusive than what we're seeing, um, that, that has regulatory agencies that are responsible and accountable and all the rest. And we need allies. And in looking for allies, we often divide these people up into good and bad. I don't necessarily think those are the best categories moving forward. And with that, I'll hand it over to Doug. Uh, well, thank you, Steve. And, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, 
in the introduction, uh, it's true I spent four years in, in West Africa with the Washington Post, but I spent uh, most of the rest of my life in Latin America. Uh, so um, Africa is just sort of a little hiatus here. Right now, I spend a lot of time in Central America, and I was just down in, with the gangs in San Pedro Sula, and then sort of the narco areas to the north up to the border. And one of the things I've been thinking about is, I, is, is having done that and spent uh, some days in there talking with a lot of unusual and weird people, is that and then trying to, I'm trying to I'm doing a project with CSIS looking at sort of other alternative governance systems in these this one particular cross border Honduras Guatemala area. This time I was just on the Honduras side and then in El Salvador. As, is what uh, what you see in the state and I'm then looking forward I think is to what uh, what you can expect from the state. Um, if you in the gang areas around San Pedro Sula, uh, you see the state almost solely as a repressor. There's nothing there except going to grab gang members that they want to kill. The only, when we were there the day after the, the three hour shootout when the police had gone in to get uh, some gang members that they thought had killed two fiscales, two uh, women fiscales who had just been killed a few days before in San Pedro. Uh, the gangs came out in force, the 18 came out in force to defend these guys. They had a three hour shootout. The the 18 had AK-47s with 60 uh, round clips. They have C4, they have grenades, and they fought the cops essentially to a standstill until, and they blew up houses, I'm going to buy the rubble of the houses, and eventually they called in the church to take the prisoners out to make sure they got, they were alive when they got to prison, because otherwise they wouldn't be. So that's one sort of typology of the state in the region. The other is the, the state, and then we want to spend a lot of time on the border, El Florido crossing there. And there you have the state as a co-actor. Co Everything is negotiated with the state because they control that space, that crossing. And it, there are many pasosiegos, hundreds of them around there. But for the security of knowing that your product will get from point A to point B across both border checkpoints, a lot of people go through the regular uh, border. And I was like, well, why would you do that? Because if they catch you outside, they'll take everything. Like if you, if you go to Paso Ciego and the cops catch you, they'll just kill you and rob you. They, it's over. If you go through the formal channels, you will be able to negotiate your way through. So you have the state as sort of a, a co-actor. And then I don't know if any of you who have spent a lot of time in Honduras. I've been hearing for years about the little town called El Paraiso in Honduras where supposedly the Alcaldia is a replica of the Casablanca, of the White House. So I set off on my great quest this time to see if, in fact, this place existed. And son of a gun if it doesn't exist. Um, but what's fascinating about the place, and you do, it really is the Alcaldia, the giant facade of the White House, Alcaldia del Paraiso, Copan, um, is that this, there's the total absence of the state. In there, there's no police, there's no judge, there's no military, there's no one on the roads, there's no one that the narcos in that town don't want to be there. It's entirely an alternative governance system. And the reason, and there were, we stopped at other sort of nar narco pueblos along the way, and it's fascinating because they view the gangs, the narcos view the gangs as necessary in San Pedro because they control certain territory. They need to deal with the gangs in that space, not because they like the gangs, not because they want to be around the gangs, but because the gangs are necessary in their view evil. As soon as, they, as soon as the gangs are outside the area where they can control territory, the narcos kill them. There is no, they just, they don't, they keep saying, we're not going to let that mala hierba, you know, that weed, those weeds grow here. They, there's no due process, there's nothing. You show up, you're not known, and they suspect you're a gang member, you're dead. And so you have these really, th three really interesting roles of the state, all in one not very large country, and then this is in one little tiny section of, of, uh, of one not very large country, which goes to the, uh, a significant point of the, of the difficulty in coming up with anything macro in the region, because all of these, every zone of every country is, is different. Looking forward, I think what you see, and if you, what's been fascinating to me, I've been spending time with the gangs in El Salvador and then the gangs in San Pedro, Sula. And what you have in El Salvador are the gangs now with a very developed political discourse, with the ability to describe themselves as the oppressed of the earth, how it's society's fault that they are the way they are, that they've done horrible things, but they need to be forgiven, and blah, blah, the whole, the whole something very, very similar in discourse to liberation theology in the 1970s, 1980s, very taken from that discourse. And I've been dealing with the gangs since the 1990s, and when I was with them in, in uh, prison, the leadership in prison in the 2012, I guess, the last time that I saw them there. 
they could they gave me like an hour and a half university class on liberation theology and this and that. Never done that before. I've been dealing with these guys for a long time. It's completely different. So they're morphing into a political a entity of some sort. Whereas in San Pedro Sula, they have a lot better weapons. They're better controlled and no political discourse at all. Um, but they're in the process of dialoguing constantly now with the Salvadoran gangs, and that will and that will spread over. And so I think that what you're in, in terms of looking forward to conflict, I think that one of the, the true damaging elements of the truce in El Salvador was it gave space for the gangs to begin taking over enormous amounts of territory that they didn't have before. Uh, if you look at, there, there are some cliques we were talking to where they had two years ago 30 members. Now they have 400. I mean, it's just, they, they've, the, the truce had opened up this space where they felt safe. In fact, in some cases, they have more kids wanting to join than than are actually uh, than are actually they're actually able to absorb. So I think the gangs will play a tremendous role in the conflict going forward because I think one of the our great misconception of the, a great misconception about the gangs is that they want to reintegrate into society. I think there, there's this myth that if we could just like the ex-combatants, I lived through the peace processes of Salvador and Nicaragua, and most of the ex-combatants wanted to integrate into society. That was that was what they aspired to. The gangs don't. If you ask them what is the ideal state, what would you like to end up at? Where would you like to be? They view themselves as an extra regional set of actors that want nothing to do with the state. They identify themselves first as MAS or DS8. Maybe then their clica in some fashion, and maybe third or fourth will come their nationality, Salvadoran, Honduran, whatever. They don't aspire to be in uh, society as we, what they want is society to leave them alone and where they have territory where they can do what they want. And so I think that as that territory expands, it's coming into, uh, is running up against another reality, which is the driving imperative for the states in the Northern Triangle is reducing violence. That is what they have to do to survive. The violence level has gotten so high and so uh, widespread, and the economic cost has become so high in everything that they do regarding extortion, et cetera, that they're going to start negotiating in ways that we probably won't like. I know I personally won't like. Uh, but the political imperative will be sort of under whatever circumstances necessary to negotiate, and the stronger the gangs get, the worse those circumstances will be with what we call civil society. I think for the first time you are seeing a bit of civil society, and this was what was one of the huge failings of the Salvadoran truce, it, took, it didn't take into any account the, the victims of the gangs. And now the victims are saying, wait a minute, <laughs> hang on, you get all these privileges, what about us and people you killed? Um, and if you look at the decapitations, the, the descuartizando, the, you know, the mutilations of the bodies, the actual homicide rates and stuff is, is very uh, horrific. Those gangs, are, and uh, Steve and I have discussed this a lot, and we, we don't always uh, see eye to eye. Uh, I think there is a, a tendency of specific gang groups to become much more tied to the transnational organized crime. Transnational in the sense of the transportista networks that work across the region, not in the sense of plugging into macro giant cartels because they, they, don't, they can't and they don't aspire to that, although they're trying hard now. I think there are groups of the, of the MS that are trying very hard to be interlocutors directly with members of Sinaloa and cut out the transportista networks. But, and it's not widespread, it's not generalized, but there are, I would say, a growing number of clicas of the gangs that now have direct access to larger amounts of cocaine. They control the, the narco menudeo, the internal consumption uh, in these countries as a way of payment, but you see them plugging into moving uh, more, and they're getting, they're getting a lot more money, and you know, if you, they, they negotiate with the state now, so it's a new and different world for them. And I think going forward, the conflict between the state and them will either have to get very bloody and probably unwinnable by the state, or to be negotiated out in ways that many of, of us will find morally uh, appalling, but probably necessary for political survival. survival. Um, I think we also have a bunch of new actors moving into the region in, in ways that we don't yet understand, and that we've never seen before, primarily the Russians and the Chinese. I think as you look at uh, the presence of the Russians growing significantly across the region, uh, very big in Nicaragua, growing very rapidly in El Salvador, they're opening their trade office this week, and by the end of the year they'll have a major new embassy there. Um, and with the Russian state, hand in hand comes Russian organized uh, crime, and what we're seeing for the first time are serious indicators of conflict between Sinaloa and the Russians in Nicaragua, because uh, you know, uh, my, my opinion, my, my research has shown is that uh, very senior levels of the Nicaraguan government protect a lot of elements of the Sinaloa cartel, the 
under ba certain conditions, which have protected Nicaragua from a lot of the ill effects of the rest of the region. Uh, primarily, they can't pay in product. They have to pay in cash so that there's not the internal consumption driving the things. Uh, they don't have a permanent, much of a permanent presence on the ground because they they always uh, bring violence, and in, in exchange for that, the government guarantees the safe passage of their of their drugs through, which was, I think, behind this the creation of recreating that model in El Salvador was a good deal behind the truce, uh, I think, when, when it was when it was uh, being set up. But if the, if you begin to have Russian and Chinese organized crime, which are very powerful, have a whole different set of tools than the local groups are ever have ever come up against. You're, you're going to see either negotiation, and everybody will come out happy with a lot of money, and we'll see a lot more dope going to Europe, or you're going to see a lot of blood, or probably some combination of the two as they work this situation. The Inside Crime just had a, an article on the, the growing Chinese uh, Chinese triads in Ar Argentina, and elsewhere you're seeing them pop up across the region. Nobody in the region has any expertise in this. Uh, very, there are very few uh, Chinese speakers on the outside of the Chinese communities. There are very few Russian speakers on the outside of the, well, there's not much of a Russian community except in Honduras and a few isolated uh, areas of, act of economic activity. But I think if you look forward to where conflict is going, you're going to see these different groups fighting over territory in new and different ways that uh, I don't think we can predict how it's going to play out. It's just, I, I would just argue they're going to be, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of violence there. And finally, I would say the, the, one of the things that was said at the, at the beginning was that you know, we, the ideological conflict has given way more like economic competition. And one of the things I think that's hugely different now in the region than it was during the wars when I was living there and covering the wars is that you now have clandestine stru structures that survived the war on both sides, uh, particularly uh, my, what the case I know best are in El Salvador, where you have, you know, you had the far right death squads, you had the, especially in El Salvador out of the FMLN, you had the Communist Party that was the sort of radical, the most hardline clandestine group. And after the wars on all sides of all the conflicts, there were groups within those armed groups that didn't demobilize. And what you've seen in one of the reasons why you have this in tremendous growth of transnational organized crime in the region, it seems like the virgin birth, right? There's nothing, then boom, you have all this crime. If you go back into the history and talk to the guys who were involved, essentially when the wars ended, these guys came, their, their clandestine structures that moved people, money, and guns during the war began moving people, money, and dope during the, immediately in the post-conflict for survival. So they had structures already established, and they've grown and they've grown with the difference that uh, they can work together now. And so you, what you see in this groups I've been looking at in El Salvador, what was, the, what was the far right always really good at? Laundering money, right? They were the rich guys. They knew how to move money. What was the left really good at? Assassinations, kidnapping, and moving people across borders clandestinely. What do you have now? The far right laundering massive amounts of money on behalf of folks who come out of the Communist Party and elsewhere who move massive amount of dope. But they're highly specialized. They've been doing it for years, and all of their... If you want to do a predictive model of where drug trafficking is going to go, just look at traditional smuggling routes. This, this is where these guys will go because that's where they control, especially if you study the, the logistics routes of the wars, those are, going to, those are your major drug trafficking routes now. And it's really fascinating to look at that, but the difference now is that they can work together, and that also poses enormous challenges to the state. And I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you, Doug. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, thanks for the invitation. Um, to go back to th those great um, uh, talks just now, and uh, before we leave the subject of um, conflict, because I was going to talk about response to these issues, I did want to note that if we're looking at the future of conflict in the region, we need to look beyond the very serious, profound issues related to organized crime and gangs, but also look at things like um, extractive industries and the conflict that that's creating, particularly in the Amazon basin. We just saw four indigenous uh, leaders killed last month over their advocacy to ban uh, extractive industries from moving into their territory. Um, also, climate change is creating an increased competition over resources, whether it's people who are fighting over water in the Corridor Seco or people who are seeing their livelihoods diminished uh, because of rising sea levels in the Caribbean. And finally, um, we see conflict uh, in areas of closing political space. I think you probably all saw the um, 
the the, the violent, uh, actually a very violent uh, reaction of the state to student protests in Venezuela uh, several months back. Um, and we see that those kinds of closing spaces um, leads to that kind of, uh, of violent interaction between state and civil society, which is very troubling. So I just want to put a marker out there that it's, it's uh, it's even more complicated than <laughs> what you might expect. Um, what I thought I would uh, talk about is what is the U.S. government's response to uh, these uh, this growing uh, set of issues that we're, we're talking about. Katie opened up the discussion by asking if we have the right tools and the right programs in place um, to address these issues. I think the short answer is no, and certainly not at the scale that needs to um, we need to have. Um, I think if those of you, you said that most of the folks here listen, were in the session this morning on urban violence, so you've probably heard about some of the successes that, that we have had, um, particularly on the prevention side, on, on working with youth. So I won't repeat that here. But these are just little drops in the ocean in terms of, of what needs to happen. Um, and I think the UAC issue, the unaccompanied uh, children issue, over the summer months really woke up the interagency and grab the attention of, of U.S. government leaders to um, what the root causes of that kind of out-migration is. And it's something that we've been, you know, saying for quite a long time is that migration is just the symptom of the issue. The issue is lack of good governance, lack of economic opportunity, and certainly lack of security. And so we were then tasked by the White House to work as an interagency to come up with a new um, invigorated Central America strategy, uh, which we have done, that uses those three pillars that I just mentioned as sort of the, the framework for what we would do in the region if resources weren't an issue. Now, of course, resources are a huge issue, um, which is why the president put forward a supplemental request over the summer months of $3.2 billion um, to deal with the UAC issue writ large. But a good portion of that um, was going to be dedicated to really investing in a very serious way in Central America across those three lines of action. Uh, that supplemental has not passed, but the um, administration has not given up. We're still going to um, try to uh, find additional resources to invest in Central America. One could argue that we have underinvested in Central America for a very long time. I think there are a lot of people uh, both on both sides of the hill who, who feel that way, and those of us who follow Latin America would, would say the same thing. We certainly say uh, in response to questions as to why our resources have been going down in Central America is because there's the rising um, private sector and they're a we're able to do a lot more through public-private partnerships than we have before. But this is beyond the reach of the private sector. It's beyond the reach of the governments themselves um, and certainly the donor community. And so we really need to have a new framework for working together in a very intensive way to uh, try to have an impact on tamping down violence and creating safer, more prosperous communities. Um, so uh, what we're talking about is on the improved governance side is really tackling corruption. And this is going to take great political will. We cannot do this for these governments. They have to stand up and be willing to tackle corruption. And we can help them with that, but that political will has to first and foremost uh, be, be uh, on, on the side of these, uh, of the, of these governments. Uh, we can help with institutional capacity building, but again, institutions are weak because people benefit from weakness, particularly in the justice sector. Um, and so you don't get convictions, you don't get cases coming to trial because people can buy off uh, investigators or prosecutors or what have you. And so it is a, a bit of a vicious uh, circle. So political will and, and policy and regulatory reform um, are huge, um, hugely important to improving governance in order to get a handle on, on these issues going forward. And then investing in economic growth. Uh, we invest in, we would want to do much more on trade facilitation, uh, customs and regulatory reform, uh, reforming the energy sector, and then of course education and workforce development is so, so important, particularly for the ninis, ni trabajar ni estudiar, you know, this large cohort of youth who are not in school, they're not working, and you know, they end up in gangs, either as victims or perpetrators of violence. And so that's uh, a, a very important target group for us to, to, to be focused on. Um, I was also in Central America the week before last, and I was absolutely dumbstruck to learn this one statistic that I have been telling everybody every day since I've been back, that only in Honduras, where Miguel showed me some of the great work that OTI is doing there, um, in Honduras, 
only 25% of children go beyond the sixth grade. 25%. So that means 75% of children have a sixth grade education or less. To me, that's the structural problem and that you've got to get a handle on because you cannot build a modern and prosperous economy on the backs of sixth graders. <laughs> you, know, you need to have a major restructuring of, of access to, to education. Uh, we do a lot of work through um, uh, with private sector on workforce development for out-of-school youth, but still that kind of basic um, knowledge uh, that uh, and, and, and learning that's required to move into modern economy with jobs or, job, or, or to be job creators is, is missing. Uh, in large part. So that's certainly very important. And then finally, of course, security. Now, people might think that our programs have been dominated by security over the, say, the last decade. And while a lot of resources have been in the security, we, we um, you know, we have also been trying to do some work on the economic growth and, demar and, and better governance, good governance, um, but, but not at the level it needs to be. So getting, getting those three areas balanced and um, appropriately um, funded, I think, is going to um, have a major, has the potential for a major impact on resolving some of these issues. Certainly under security, police reform and community policing and violence prevention strategies are really important things to continue to build out. Um, as Enrique Roy said this morning, we, we have seen some early signs of success of our Central America Regional Security Strategy, or CARSI, initiative, I guess it's called, hence the E at the end of CARSI. Um, and so, but, but we are far, far from um, getting those kinds of uh, investments to the scale that's needed to have an enduring impact. And so what's required for the implementation of this strategy are a couple of things. First, absolutely depends on leadership of the governments of the region. This has to be a collective vision that has to be, you know, their political will that drives it and they've got to show that commitment, as I mentioned before, through um, the kind of cracking down on corruption and the policy reforms that only they can bring forward. Uh, the role of the private sector, instrumental, and not just as corporate social responsibility in terms of we, we, we have had some great partners um, from the private sector who have helped rehab schools, who have helped contribute um, you know, technologies to classrooms, but what we really need the private sector to do is, uh, and, and they're doing some of that already very successfully, is workforce development skills and making sure that the kids who are coming out of, whether it's sixth grade middle school or high school, you know, have the skill set they need for modern economy jobs. And so we've seen um, those kinds of investments really pay off for the youth that have been involved in those programs with very high incidence of, you know, 80% and above of kids who go through those workforce development programs who either find a job or go on to continue their studies. Um, we have to involve youth themselves. We can't design these youth programs for youth without youth. <laughs> so they've got to be embraced by youth. And I think one, uh, La Juventud Contra la Violencia, or Youth Against Violence, um, which is now in every country, represent, is, a, is a movement, it's a youth movement throughout the region, uh, has been very successful in, uh, in reaching out to youth um, for prevention programs. I also happened to see their work in, in Honduras, and it was very, very impressive. And you know, they, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the statistic they used was that only 5% of youth are involved in gangs. And so that means that you know, you're working with the 95% of youth um, you want to keep out of those gangs and give them positive role, mo role models, give them mentors, uh, give them some sense of, um, you know, what it means to be cool <laughs> in a different way than, you know, what they see in, in their neighborhoods. Um, we have to involve, of course, communities um, themselves and local authorities as well as the church. That's the other thing that really impressed upon me, the visit that we had with the violence interrupters and the, and the role that the church plays in giving cover to some of the youth uh, work that we're, do excuse me, that we're doing in the region. Um, and, fin and, and not finally, a trilateral cooperation, also very important. We have Colombians now that we're sponsoring through a trilateral cooperation between Colombia, Mexico, and the United States to help them stand up um, victim response units within their uh, human rights uh, ministry um, to uh, benefit from the lessons learned in Colombia and how they did that. And, and that kind of transfer of, of knowledge has been quite helpful to the Mexicans. Same in Brazil. They're stepping <coughs> forward to work with us in, in El Salvador 
to help on uh, crime prevention based on the successful crime prevention activities um, that they've had in the favelas in Rio. Um, so I think more of those kinds of south-south levels of cooperation can be very helpful going forward. And finally, I think the very important um, role uh, focus that we must maintain on women and the huge amount of gender-based violence that exists in the region is something that we cannot lose sight of, that even though gangs are, tend to be um, predominantly um, populated by males, and the victims tend to be primarily male. Uh, there is a huge problem in the region with gender-based violence. And what we have seen um, in Colombia, as an example, is that where you link legal assistance to psychosocial assistance and marry those two up so you have a survivor-based method of dealing with um, that kind of crime, uh, we have seen a 600% increase in the reporting of gender-based violence crime in, through the centers that we're working with in Colombia. And in El Salvador, we have stood up a couple of victim assistance units to focus specifically on uh, gender-based violence. And there, again, because of the link up with um, legal assistance and psychosocial assistance coming together, uh, we have seen that a, a uh, one hundred percent of those claims of gender-based violence have actually been presented <coughs> in a courtroom and ninety-seven percent of those cases le le led to convictions of the perpetrators. So um, again, I think that was very a, a very important lesson learned and something that, that needs to be um, scaled up. Um, but that's the issue. How do you get to scale? And as I say, to get to scale, you're going to need huge investments. Certainly no one donor can take responsibility for this. It's going to require domestic resource uh, mobilization on, be on, on the part of governments in the area. It's going to require the, the investments of the private sector, of uh, donors writ large, and as I mentioned, I think um, also emerging donors who are standing up their own uh, from the region um, who have a direct interest in, in seeing this tide turned. So I think I'll just leave it there, and then we'll open up the discussion. Great. Thank you so much, all three of you. I think that's a very interesting, albeit very sobering, description of the magnitude of the problem we're facing. And thank you, Beth, for reminding us of the other dimensions in which um, conflict plays out in the region. Um, we've got about 20 minutes for questions, but I just want to start by asking all of you to maybe just elaborate a little bit further on a point that each of you um, touched on, which is the question of institutional fragility. Um, you, um, I think, Doug, you said at one point the state is going to have to make a very difficult choice between um, something that's bloody and something that's unsavory. Um, one of you referred to, or I think all of you in different ways referred to the state being either absent, complicit, or, or at very best, incapable. Um, and Beth, you mentioned the ever-present critical question of, of political will. Given, given this, um, and given that we are in a, in a um, scenario in which resources are scarce, there are other policy priorities for the U.S. government. Latin America has seen a decline in resources um, over the last um, couple of decades. Um, what, what do you think is the most important, um, what, what role can the U.S. play, and what should our priorities be in assistance given um, state weakness, institutional fragility, but given the budget scenario that we're in right now? Sure. Uh, well, I think that that to me is, is you know, the, the $100 million question. I think institutions are, uh, I think that getting to the root of the institutional weakness has to do with two things that, that Beth mentioned, which is, uh, primarily corruption. And I think that one of the factors that I find in, in the discussion on Central America, particularly in the, the cry for Plan Colombia for, for Central America and stuff, they, they, there's no, the political will is not there to, to handle that. And if you, if those governments, if you look across the Central American governments and what you can document on the corruption that has flown out, the Saca government, the Funes government, El Salvador, the other ones uh, in the other countries, there would be billions of dollars. If they invest in, if they had stolen half of what they stole and invested the other half, then we wouldn't have these problems. So I get really frustrated when they keep saying we, that we need all these massive new resources. No, what we need is the political will 
on the part of leadership of these countries to stem the massive corruption that has deprived their people over the last two decades of the resources that they need. It's not, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's rocket science, but that goes to the heart of the judicial system the inability to pay police decent wages and why you have hugely larger private security forces and private intelligence forces than the, the state police forces and the state intelligence services, um, and why the justice system is so easily distorted. I did a, a piece for Prism Magazine at NDU a couple years ago now arguing that the Northern Triangle had essentially become a transactional state. Everything could be bought and sold. The result of your judicial case did not depend on on the strength of your case, it depended on what judge you could buy, who could pay the most for the judge. And almost everything across society has become transactional because that is what the state has become. And I, so I think that to me, if you want to get at the institutional fragility, you have to deal, as, as, as Beth was talking about, with, with corruption in ways that the, the U.S. government has never been willing to do before in these countries, uh, and that is have significant penalties as, associated with withdrawal of funds, et cetera. They're going through a big discussion in El Salvador now of certain things related to the, uh, the millennial, Millennium Fund because the, it's clear that the Salvadoran government is not living up to the promises it made two weeks ago <laughs> on, to, on how they're going to spend that money. Uh, yeah, so they're the MCC. So there's already discussions over how do we handle those type of things. And I think, given the dire circumstances and the history and the lack of resources, you know, I think I think that our response has to be pretty uncompromising on this. Stephen. <laughs> well, I th yeah, I think this is this is the this is the, the critical question. I, I I don't think we. We know, but I think that um, there are. I guess I look at it as there. There are kind of two different ways you can go at it. You can go at it. And you can try and you can try and fix everything for them. You can try and put laws in. You can try and train every one of their guys. You can, and that's obviously these are very expensive propositions. Or you can think about it as they they have most of what they need. Um, they they even have quite a few more than a few capable people uh, in place to do it. We, we have examples of that. Um, the one shining example of that is Claudia Paz y Paz mm -hmm. in Guatemala, uh, basically taking the reins of an institution that had undergone some serious reform, for sure, um, but essentially taking the reins of an institution that had largely been dysfunctional for, for many, 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 many years and, and making it, if not largely functional, certainly functional and, and showing some incredible results. Um, but we have other uh, situations in which they're, they're not such big examples, not taking over an entire institution, but even examples in, uh, in Honduras, um, you know, where you have um, small projects that, that maybe um, the, a lot of their costs are for personnel because they get ex-police and ex-prosecutors to work as interlocutors between neighborhoods that are suffering from great amounts of violence and those people who are suffering from the violence. So you get a trustworthy, this is what I was talking about, a guarantor, a trustworthy interactor between these two spaces, and you see results. Um, that isn't that expensive, I think, in the scheme of things, creating, in, creating spaces and paying for, perhaps at least at the beginning, some of these um, interlocutors who play an incredible role, and lowering violence by incredible amounts, too. Um, so there are there are these instances, but but what what can you do? What what does OTI do and, and USAID and others do? Um, I think that they can do things that are extremely important um, that go way beyond whether or not are we fixing it or not. I just think that that is that is just the wrong way to start. I think you need to give them the space to fix it. What do you do? You need what it what does the prosecutor who's working with you want? They're human beings, right? So they want space to do their work. They want political independence. They don't want a larger political force dictating what they prosecute and what they don't prosecute. They don't want the political transition to determine whether or not they have a job, et cetera, et cetera. They want independence to do their job, right? So you could promote that. I think there are a lot of different political diplomatic ways and also financial ways in which you could promote that. And they want safety. They want themselves to be safe. 
They want their families to be safe. They want their colleagues to be safe. These, these are things, these are spaces I think that we need to think about. We need to think about how to create space for people who are dedicated and ready to act, um, the space they need to operate. And I think that is what eventually leads to long-lasting reform. Thanks, Stephen. Beth, anything to add? I uh, was in Guatemala a couple of months ago, and I, that was the, my first uh, Foreign Service assignment in the early 90s, and I hadn't been back uh, since I left, so about 20 years. And then um, when I went back, I was in Zone 10, and it absolutely blew my mind, the level of infrastructure and the incredible roads that between uh, Guate and Shela, for example, it was, all good, it was all paved. I mean, it was just, where did all this money come from? This is amazing. And we were on our way to the Western Highlands to see our health programs, and the Western Highlands malnutrition rate for children under five is still 50%, hasn't budged in 20 years. So right there, you know, that's your problem. You've got, a, you do have a lot of resources, but clearly they're not being spent in the areas where they're most needed, which is in social investments, I would say. Um, I would, I agree with the, the points of uh, my colleagues here in terms of, you know, they, they do have resources that they, they, um, they, they can put, um, toward uh, these problems that it is a question, uh, first and foremost, of political will. And I do believe there are change agents, um, even in um, these um, countries that have seemed to, you know, are basically in Honduras, I would say, is close to a failed state. But, I, but even there, I think, you know, there are um, political champions and change agents um, who want to do the right thing. I like to think of uh, all politics being local, I think our great, greatest chance for success and demonstration of success is at the municipal level. I think, um, you know, we, and we have seen this through our community violence uh, prevention programs, is that if you can work at the community level, at municipal level, help them uh, just collect the, the, the fees and the taxes that they already, um, you know, have on the books and then have an open participatory process about how those resources are going to get invested back into the community. Engage your leadership, whether it's from the, the schools, the hospitals, the, um, you know, the police, uh, civil society on how you can identify where your hot spots are, where you need to put street lights, uh, how you can reclaim some public space from gang ownership. If you can, I, you can do that at the local level, and we've seen it time and time again. And I think, you know, it's building on that momentum and growing democracy from the grassroots up that's going to be, I think, the answer over the longer term. Thank you very much. I'd like to open it up to the audience for any questions. Okay. I think there's a mic that's, or you can, yeah, use this one, I think. Thanks so much to, to the panelists for your, um, for your interesting insights. I had a question. You mentioned, um, you know, declining resources on part of the U.S. government. It's certainly not also a trend if you look into European donors and so on. So I was wondering how you look into um, existing and emerging, let's say, regional integration mechanisms, but also regional organizations like SICA, like the OAS, CARICOM. We haven't talked a lot about the Caribbean, but how would you see uh, the role of the of those actors, uh, especially also regarding the linkages between the conflict issues? and the organized crime issues, because you touched upon both of them, and there's also, if you look at countries like you mentioned Guatemala, El Salvador, you also have linkages between structural conflict drivers and, and issues of organized crime. So how would you look into at the role of, of regional um, integration mechanisms, but also the role of regional organizations to address these complex interlinkages? Thanks. I don't know if anyone would like to speak to that first, or? Well, um, I, I totally agree that these are regional problems and they require regional solutions because, you know, you push on gang violence in one place and it can just simply move across the border to someplace else. And so the uh, role of regional institutions is critically important to this, particularly as it relates to um, economic growth. Um, as I mentioned, um, trade harmonization, customs and regulatory reform, I think will open up uh, these countries for greater investments. And so therefore, SICA has a, a very important role to play. But also, I think, um, developing these communities of practice across borders and identifying what is working. Uh, we're having an evidence summit actually in um, Guatemala in, um, I guess, later this month uh, to bring together practitioners from the United States, from some of these 
cities in the United States that have had great success in controlling gang violence, along with uh, those partners who are working in the communities in the field with police, with politicians, with um, um, other sectors that have a stake in this to begin to identify best practices and um, helping um, identify those things that can travel, if you will, um, obviously to be adapted to local circumstances. I think those kinds of things are an important way forward. Any other questions, Enrique? Yes, um, it's, it's, it's more a comment and it's probably connecting with, with experiences in the US uh, and, and many in, also in Latin America because I think what we have seen is that we have been able to really show reductions in violence when we focus all the resources on the 5% and not in the 95%. Mm -hmm. But what we've seen the ceasefire approach or we've seen uh, the UPP approach really reducing or the, even, even the, the truce in Salvador, in Salvador, we can like it or not, but when you focus on the guys, on the 5% that are really driving the violence mm -hmm. and you find ways to intervene in that space, you really have the opportunity to reduce it. And I think uh, most of, and I say this as a counterpart from, from the Mexican government when I was in that position, I think where we, the, the theory of change we're working with is working with that 95%. And we're making, someone in a, in a meeting, in a previous meeting said, we're making the good, our good guys, we're making them better. Uh, and I think we have to be much more aggressive in terms of finding solutions to work with that, identify that 5% and really work with them. Um, and I think it's something we have to really think more in terms of the programming USA is putting for, for the agendas in these countries. Any further? It sounds actually, Stephen, that sounds um, sort of similar to your point about the characterization of the good guys and the bad guys and needing to um, be able to work with some of those guys that may not fit quite so clearly into our black and white spectrum. Uh, certainly, and, and, and Enrique can, can speak to this, I'm sure, but uh, you, you know, I think when you talk about the 5%, you're talking about a clearly a sort of criminal 5%, clearly identified as such. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and when I talk about good, good criminals, I'm talking about people who work with the state, actually. There might be some very people, some people who are a little bit shy about um, who are actually very high level officials in the state. And they, they might play very, you know, maybe even doubtful roles right now as we look at them right now. What's the potential? What's the potential of, of, of some of these actors? I, I think that, that some of the actors that came out of places like Colombia, um, you know, some of the heroes that came out of places like Colombia were not necessarily looked upon as heroes and the initial stages of intervention or, or you know, serious government intervention at that time. So I think that there, is, there are a lot of actors that are kind of walking this fine line in these very gray territories. Um, gray territories because there's a lot of crime and corruption swirling around them. And a lot of them have their jobs because they have been either, they've either looked the other way or they've participated directly in these types of activities. But does that make them, does that automatically disqualify them going forward? And if we disqualified all of them, who are we going to work with? So this is, this is what I say, good, uh, a good criminal. They, they could even be a major sort of economic uh, motor in a, in, a, in a regional space. Um, you know, they, they own all of the major industries in that territory. Are you just going to turn your back on them? Um, you know, they, there, there is, there's a lot of, it's, it's dubious and doubtful territory, and especially as we look at it, and it's very easy for us to make sort of broad sweeping judgments about, about what's happening. But if we look back at our own history, again, these, these actors sometimes can play very important roles. And, and more important than that even is that the local actors who are operating in those spaces with those people are already working with them. Are we going to ask them to disengage with their operations? I'm talking about economic, political, social interactions with these people. So, so these are these are gray spaces, and I think we need to I think we need to figure out how to operate in those gray spaces. And, 
and and Doug, given your comment about um, the need for the USG and other donors to be very tough on corruption um, and to um, possibly put into place some measures that we shied away with, do you do you agree with um, Stephen's idea that we need to work in this gray area? My experience is yes, and the short answer is yes. I think that uh, my experience is there is most people would rather be legal than illegal. But then the choices offered to them and the positions where they are, that is not of true choice to them. They're, that's not a choice that they can make uh, evenly balancing things out. So I think in, in having spent a lot of time in, in Colombia and looking at some really good people in El Salvador and Honduras uh, who are messed up in, in things that we would be considered to be illegal because their survival depends on that. And if there were conditions where they could disengage from that and go another direction, they and a large number of people would go with them. But they don't feel that the correlación de fuerzas, you know, the, the balance of power in their particular circumstances allow them to do that. So one of the challenges, I think, and, and this goes to what I think part of what, what Steve was saying, if you can change the equation for them so that being, and, and I think, I mean, to me being tough on corruption is you can't take this money and give it to your idiot brother-in-law and let him walk out the door with it because that's what we've always done. You know, if we put it for the road, it's going to go for the road. Now, is that guy going to contract somebody we may not be particularly thrilled with because he has the equipment to do it? I say, if the road gets done, you're in good shape, uh, or even close to done, you're in good shape. But I think in the in the broader range of things, if if, if you change the equation for people, I, mean, I, I just got an email yesterday from a guy from uh, that I used to deal with in the college cartel. I hadn't heard from him for years. Oh, Douglas, how are you doing? Uh, uh, remember when Rodrigo Gilberto told me I couldn't talk to you anymore? They were going to kill me. Ah, ha, ha, you know. But now he's moved on to another uh, dimension. He's like a respected. Um, guy in an NGO that's doing a lot of good because he always told me, if I, you know, I, they got my family, you know, they know where I live. I can't leave this particular thing. I kept saying, better though, you know, why the hell are you with these guys? Can't do anything else. You change the equation, especially in the rural areas, especially in the municipalities, where they felt they were safe enough to move away. You would see a, an entirely different calculation going, okay, the state, I could do with the state and live. Oh, that'd be a lot more fun, you know. I think we've got time for about one or two questions before Bob comes to remind us that it's time to go upstairs. I see one in over there. Thanks very much for your comments. Um, I wanted to ask, to what extent do you see civil society organizations that are working around peace, justice, and security uh, creating coalitions or working together to guarantee security in their, in their own areas? I, I think civil society organizations have been in the forefront of, of trying to tackle these issues, and um, I give them a great deal of credit. I think um, they can't do it alone, and so hence um, these community-based security plans um, are a way that through civil society organization um, organizations and the church again i was really impressed by the role and the, the role of the church both catholic and evangelical um ha and the, the credibility that they have in these communities they've got the convening power to bring in the other state institutions to work together to um, create these these plans that are are having as if you've heard from enrique this morning a, a very direct impact on lowering levels of violence I would just say also that where they are not present, that is a, a huge amount of space that criminals um, take advantage of very often. Um, so while we can talk about their importance, they're, they're hugely important to push, push things forward. And if they're not there, you can see the result of that as well. Two, two um, points. One. Um, I know that there are better guys and worse guys or good criminals or bad criminals, but very often you can get yourself into the problem that they got to uh, in, in Colombia where they ended up with the guys fighting the guerrillas, the paras, being they themselves another force for evil. So you've got, you've got to be very careful about what you do with that. Second of all, what has worked very effectively, uh, again in Colombia, but also uh, on occasions in Honduras, 
has been the use of citizens as social auditors. That is, attempting to look at how a, pro, pro, uh, uh, a construction project, a road, a school is built by getting the stakeholders in that school or that road to understand systems of how you control that. Um, and it's been done. I mean, this is not something pie in the sky. The, I think almost every local government USA program um, in Colombia, well, I know that in, to be the case in Colombia, has been doing that for the last decade or more. Um, and certainly on occasion, as I said, in Honduras as well. I, I think that that's, I think certainly the, the, the issue of the AUC and folks in Colombia is a clear issue of how slippery the slope is and how desperate it can be. I would argue on the, on the citizen, one of the huge changes that the gangs have brought in the region is the inability of citizens to audit anything. Uh, and especially as you move them, as they move in and take over real political power in places uh, like Ilopango and, and other places in, in El Salvador, and, and they begin extorting the contracts out of the government, there's, there, you're not going to get any citizen auditing out of anything because they'll die, and or their family members, who are, they're committed to it. So I think the situation in the northern tier particularly mitigates strongly for survival against the abilities of these groups to function, not because they're chicken. I think they've done mag magnificent work where they can, but I think the self-preservation instinct takes over. Uh, Often and rightfully, and uh, and in those areas, especially where you have people on the ground who know exactly where you live, who you see day to day, who are extorting the woman who makes pupusas, who's extorting the guy who comes in for gas, who's extorting the guy who comes in with Coca Cola, who's extorting the guy who comes in with water, you're not going to mess with those people on a local level or ask to see how the books are run. And I think that that is one of the great sort of tragedies of what the gangs have brought in their neighborhoods is what little of that there had been, and as much of an effort that has been has been truncated very abruptly in those areas. It, it obviously has to go with a more concerted effort at establishing security and building um, community, uh, community capacity. Um, but I think, he, again, I've seen it in places as difficult, uh, for instance, in Colombia, as Meta uh, was a year or two ago, and still is, in fact. So it's, it's possible. You're right. Thanks, Joel. Eduardo, do you still have a question? Yes. Um, no, just pointed out that we, when we talk about violence, we talk about always about the poor. And neither presentation now today or that this morning talks about the financial sector. Obviously, financial sector, the banks are so accomplished in the crime, organized crime in the Triangulo Norte that is a shame we are not doing anything on that. You see, uh, all this money from extortions, from ransoms, all go to the banks. And it's no other way to explain the boom of construction in these three poor countries. And it's like we have double standards, like satanize the poor, violence, and not talking about the white collar or elites, uh, organized crime. crime. And I, I think, um, I wish uh, Ambassador Brownfield was here uh, to talk about what Diane L is trying to do on that, but obviously, all the money coming from organized crime in the Triangulo Norte goes through the banks. And uh, we are not talking about them. We are talking about the poor people that also the victims of the system. So that's wanted to comment. Um, I mean, yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing a two-year project on elites and organized crime, and obviously we're, we're looking at how these things are are intertwined. I think that the at the end of the day, the um, the, the difficult thing is again sort of. Uh, I think that those those actors can be incredibly important. Um, not only you, do you have to sort of monitor them, but they also are uh, incredibly important in, in terms of agents of change. Um, so I think that there are. Uh, what I would say about that is that there are leverage points there too, and I think that the U.S. Um, and other institutions don't use the amount of leverage that they have in in the way that perhaps they should. Um, you know, there's there's uh, bank issues. There's also visa issues. There are other ways to pressure. I think for for reforms, for more accountability, for more things that are being that that can be pushed from the top, so to say, rather than think about the violence in the in the poorest neighborhoods. I agree with you. 
I would just say I, I agree, just very briefly agree as well. I think one if you look at the distorting factors in the economies down there, there's nothing more distorting than what Petro Caribe has done through Alba Nisa and Alba Petroleos, where you have hundreds of millions of unaccounted dollars flowing through. And what they do is create an entirely parallel structure of the government. I mean, Ortega talks about his $450 million slush fund, and they probably double that. Certainly, Alba Petroleos in El Salvador is well over $600 million, probably closer to $800 million. It doesn't go through the budgetary process. There's no accountability, and it's there. So yes, but because we were talking about the future of conflict as an armed conflict, uh, we got on what we did. But I think that the, the issue of the complicity of the elites was in the work that Steve and others are, are doing, I think, is fundamental to understanding how to ever, yeah, I mean, my, uh, yes, uh, uh, how, the, how to fix this. Because unless that elite sector changes, nothing else will ultimately change. We have time for one last brief question. Um, I actually interview UACs to try to get them pro bono representation. Um, so, I, and uh, as Ms. Hogan said, um, most of them drop out around sixth grade. Uh, besides the economic reason, it's because what they tend to tell me is that they don't have access to a safe school or they're way too far away for them to get to one. And so the problem for the question for me is um, how do you solve the, 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 the I guess the location of, um, of the secondary schools in, um, out to be for them to be a little bit more outside on, in the peripheries and also how do you, like what actors what type of actors do you see primarily working towards that if there is a specific type of actor you would like to work on that? Just reminding us, Bob's in the back with his red card. I've let us run over. So just a brief answer to that, if you don't mind. Yeah, I don't think there is an answer to that. Um, quite honestly, um, I think we really need to apply our minds to that. And when I say increase resources, it, I, I, I do agree that there are lots of resources in the region. But I think to really tackle primary and secondary education, it's going to require external investment in addition to domestic resource mobilization. But clearly, you need to build schools. You need to look at boarding schools. You know, you need to look at uh, alternative learning environments. Um, I, I, I think this is absolutely key to the longer term uh, resolution of many of the issues that we've talked about today. Let's give a hand to our panelists. Thank you so much.